Looking around the room and assessing uh, ages, it looked like everybody here, with the exception of Angela, probably uh, had some relationship with the Vietnam. Either you were there, you had a relative there, a, a son, a daughter, a father, an uncle, a cousin. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to Vietnam either in the good old days in the 60s and 70s or as a tourist since then? Only one? Okay, you had been there. I was in Vietnam with the USO in 1968. Oh, 68? With a tour from Chicago. Okay, you look much too young to be uh, <laughs> there in 68. Yeah. Okay, well, in any event, we will have a Q&A session. I hope you'll feel free to participate and uh, share your experiences. And uh, hopefully what I can do this morning is perhaps provide some information, some of which is historical that you may not have been aware of before. And also what's going on in Vietnam and the South China Sea right now, which is uh, beginning to warm up because of uh, China's growing naval power and China's recent declaration that they view the South China Sea as what they call a core area. And up till now, there's only been two core areas, Tibet and Taiwan. So it's interesting that they now think that the entire China, South China Sea should be there. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Well, think back to your civics class. Who wrote those words? Yeah. yeah, if you said Thomas Jefferson, you are correct. 50% correct. They are also the opening words of the Declaration of Independence that Ho Chi Minh read on September the 2nd, 1945, which was the day that the Japanese surrendered to General MacArthur. You didn't know that. <laughs> well, that's one thing already. I have to read one other uh, tidbit uh, to you. This is an extract of a letter. Oh, goodness, I better put my glasses on. This is an extract. Security and freedom can only be, be guaranteed by our independence from any colonial power and our free cooperation with all other powers. It is with this firm conviction that we request of the United States as guardians and champions of world justice to take a decisive step in support of our independence. What we ask has been graciously granted to the Philippines like the Philippines, our goal is full of independence and full cooperation with the United States. We will do our best to make this independence and cooperation profitable to the whole world. And who do you suppose wrote that? Ho Chi Minh. Also Ho Chi Minh. And who did he write it to? Uh, Roosevelt. President Harry Truman. And what was the response? No. There was no response. Had there been, we might have seen a different course of history subsequent to World War II. Uh, this, of course, you all recognize as the, uh, the old presidential palace. Uh, it's now called the Independence Museum. And this is one of the tanks that you remember seeing in the newsreel crashing through the, the wrought iron gates on April 30th, 1975, which ended the war. Vietnam then and now is the title. Uh, I thought it should be past and present, but I was overruled. <laughs> <laughs> and what we're going to do then is, is both history-wise and also photographs and scenes, kind of show you what is going on in Vietnam, what things were happening then, and what is happening now. Uh, as you probably all know, Vietnam is rapidly uh, industrializing. The government's uh, objective is to be fully industrialized by 2020. Well, this kind of typifies uh, then and now. This uh, this is the right hand. Well, I'm looking north. 
This is the east bank of the Saigon River. And as you can see, it's dense jungle. Uh, about the only thing different between now and when the French uh, occupied Vietnam is they do now have some electricity in most of these little shacks. Basically, everybody over here is a fisherman. They've got their boats, their old little skiffs lined up against the, uh, the river bank. The opposite side of the river, the left side of the bank, which by the way used to be a Cambodian uh, outpost way back in the uh, 14 and 1500s, is obviously uh, being built up rather rapidly. You've got high-rise office buildings, you've got uh, very nice uh, townhouses out in this area. Uh, up in the north, this is now looking north, uh, you've heard about the Coochie Tunnels, they're about 35 miles up in that area. Farther over in this area is where Intel has just established its largest plant, its largest manufacturing facility in the world. 500,000 square feet. That's five and a half football fields. Uh, they presently, well, they don't have them fully staffed yet, but the goal is they'll have 4,000 employees. Most of what they're doing is assembling uh, chipsets for laptops and mobile computer devices. They're not yet assembling computers. The reason they're there, of course, is because labor in China, excuse me, in Vietnam is now considerably cheaper than in China. So the chipsets from here will probably be flown up to Shanghai and that's where they'll be assembled. My iMac was assembled in Shanghai. Isn't that an American company? Oh, you better believe it. Uh -huh. Intel, of course, the world's largest, uh, most profitable microprocessor uh, company. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Uh -huh. Headquartered in Santa Clara, California. Uh, they've got a big plant you probably know out in uh, north of Albuquerque at Rio something or other. Yeah, Phoenix too, I think. Or they're in Phoenix too. Okay. So this is what we're going to talk about today. A little bit about geography and history. Uh, some comparative country to country facts. We're going to talk about the political structure. It's an interesting structure, and Angela and I have had discussions before about the advantages of long-term planning, which of course does not exist in the United States, because every two years we elect a Congress, and they only spend one year, as you know, campaigning to get ready to raise money for the next year. And then, of course, if you change Congress, you change all the policies and procedures and plans that previously existed. So why we don't have an energy plan? Well, why don't we have any kind of a long-term plan? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the economy and investments for those of you that might be interested in speculating on Vietnam. Most uh, uh, global analysts will view Vietnam as maybe the next China. They do have to do some things to get their act together, but it's growing very rapidly, as you will see. I want to talk a little bit about human rights, because that's always an issue. Although it's not as much of an issue as it used to be, because we need Vietnam to support us militarily and what's happening in uh, Southeast Asia. We'll have time for Q&A, and then we're going to have a little contest, by the way. Uh, one of the things we're going to do today is we're all going to become fluent in Vietnamese. <laughs> and for the person who does the best, then there are a couple of little prizes here. So that's what we're going to do. OK, here's the language. Now. Sin Chao, X in Vietnamese is pronounced like an S. Commit a sin. Chao is like what the Navy people eat. Sin Chao. That is hello. Good morning. You know, that's typically when you meet somebody during the day, you say Sin Chao. And the person will say Sin Chao back to you. Everybody say it, please. Sin Chao. Sin Chao. Okay. Now remember, don't forget, there is going to be a little contest at the end. Okay, let's get a quick geographic orientation, especially since uh, only one of you apparently has ever been to Vietnam. Well, let's see. How many of you have been to China? Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's see. Here's the Hong Kong, Macau complex up here. You've all flown in and out. Uh, there's Angkor Wat up there. Uh, there's uh, Singapore way down there. 
Yeah, up there's Bangkok. Everybody's been in and out of Bangkok. Okay, here's Vietnam, roughly a thousand uh, kilometers along the coast. Um, the areas that are of special interest is, with respect to the various countries that surround that area, to include Malaysia and the Philippines and uh, the Chinese, this of course is the South China Sea. Now before I forget, one of the things I had to change in my book, any reference to the South China Sea, they said, you can't call it the South China Sea. It's called the East Sea. East. E-A-S-T. E well, because, yeah. Because of the word China. The uh, Paracel and the Spratly Islands you'll occasionally hear about. Uh, the most recent incident was in March last month where uh, some, uh, a Philippine oil exploration company was harassed by some Chinese gunboats because both the Paracels and Spratleys, besides being excellent fishing grounds, are also known to have a lot of minerals and oil, and the water is relatively shallow there. These are really just ar archipelagos. Uh, Afterwards, during the Q&A session, I'll tell you a little bit of the history as to why China thinks that it owns the South China Sea. And the reason, well, I'll tell you the reason right now, is in order to gain Chinese support during the, uh, what we call the Vietnam, they call, Vietnam War, they call the American War. The leader of North Vietnam at the time was a fellow named Pham Van Dong. Ho Chi Minh had already died. And in correspondence with Chow and Lai, who was the premier of China, Fan Van Dong, in writing, acknowledged the fact that China owned the South China Sea. Oh. So China naturally assumed it controls the South China Sea. That's now a bone of contention. And the Vietnamese officials now will say, well, the only reason we did that is we needed their support. So they have just chosen to kind of pretend that it, it never happened. That's a political issue in, in Vietnam as well as in China. A little bit about history. Uh, for about 800 years, China uh, ruled Vietnam as a province. In fact, Vietnam, the word Viet in Vietnamese means people. The word Nam in Vietnamese means south or southern. So basically, Vietnamese are southern people. Southern to what? Southern to China. About the time Coronado was uh, looking for the seven cities of uh, gold in the United States, the Portuguese had worked their way around the uh, Cape of Good Hope past the Indian Ocean and were now in the process of setting up commercial trading posts like Macau and also uh, Da Nang and Hoi An on the uh, uh, coast of uh, Vietnam. In fact, uh, everybody's heard about Hoi An, I'm sure. It's one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It's just a little, whoops, I'm sorry, let me do that one. It's just south of uh, Da Nang, Hoi An is located. It used to be actually the largest trading post along the South China Sea. Now it's just a little teeny town where you go to get your clothes tailored and eat a lot of good meals. Um, French got interested in uh, this part of the world. Don't forget, during that time of the world, that was the age of colonization. We had the British in Thailand and India. We had Germany, France. Everybody had little commercial establishments along the coast of China, especially up around Shanghai and Hong Kong. The British were in Hong Kong. The uh, French decided they needed to get into the uh, business of establishing colonies. So they set up, set up shop here in Da Nang after bombarding the Vietnamese town, ostensibly because they wanted to protect Catholic missionaries. Uh, about 10 years later, they uh, came down here into Saigon, invaded, and within a very few years, this entire, entire area, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, was of course called French Indochina. So that was their recognized colony. Almost immediately, a Vietnamese resistance movement to the French occupation began. 
Ho Chi Minh is born in 1890 up here just outside the little town of Vin. Well, it's not a little town, it's a rather big town. Uh, he is educated at the university down here in Hue. While he's there, he gets involved in some anti-French activities. The French are on the lookout for him, as well as some of his other associates. So Ho decides he's going to go down here to uh, Fan Tiet. I've got a photograph from Fan Tiet I'll show you in a little bit. And he teaches school there for one year. Then he goes down to uh, Saigon. He boards a French freighter. He goes to Marseille. And he lives for the next 30 years outside of Vietnam. He lives in London for a while. He lives in New York City for a while. We think that he was in Boston for a while. We're not sure. He's 